So this is me at the WHO. And when I got an email a year and a half ago to serve as an expert advisor at the WHO, I honestly thought it was spam. I was about to hit delete, delete, delete. <laughs> so I had to call them and get them to, to tell me that it was actually for real. And I did go to the WHO, and there I am sort of doing a selfie in front of the flags and taking pictures of all of the member flags. So it was, it was quite exciting for me and quite an honor. But to tell you about the work that we did, it was very important. So the expert advisory panel, they meet at the WHO every two years, and they're asked to review treatments for a variety of diseases, so cardiovascular disease, cancer, and liver disease. And the reason why this is important is because the WHO uses this panel, uses this list as a guideline um, for low and, income, low and medium income countries, so countries that may be uh, affected by these diseases. We were asked to review the treatments for viral hepatitis, so hepatitis B and hepatitis C, which has an enormous impact globally, which causes an enormous disease burden. We were fortunate to get these medicines added to the essential medicines list, and it was a challenge, but I was quite happy to say that we were successful in that. So just to give you a sense of why viral hepatitis is important, I'm going to give you sort of a hepatitis 101 lecture. So there are three main types of hepatitis. You've probably heard of hepatitis A. It's transmitted by food or contaminated water, and it's like you get food poisoning. You get infected, but you get better, and there's a vaccine for it to prevent infection. Hepatitis B and hepatitis C are also viruses that attack the liver, but they cause persistent infection or chronic lifelong infection. And there's over 400 million people worldwide infected with viral hepatitis. So just think, that's like 10 times the population of Canada. In Canada, we actually don't have good statistics. We think that there's about 400,000 people infected. And just to give you another perspective, here in Calgary, just in the Calgary Liver Unit, since 2011, or in the last five years, we've seen 3,000 new patients diagnosed with viral hepatitis. And that doesn't include all the patients that have been seen in follow-up and followed for many years. So these are chronic, persistent infections that are transmitted by infected blood and body fluids. So if you get viral hepatitis, you can get liver disease. And I'll demonstrate the FibroScan later and show how the FibroScan can show how your liver can progress from being inflamed or pitch or something that looks red to developing scarring and then severe scarring, which means cirrhosis or end-stage liver disease. And when that happens, you're at risk of developing liver cancer. In fact, if you have hepatitis B, you can develop liver cancer even without cirrhosis. And you don't have to be a hepatologist to look at this slide and say, this looks bad, okay? So this is liver cancer. And most people in the world, if they develop liver cancer, there's no effective treatments, and most people die. And in fact, the National Institute of Health, or the National Cancer Institute in the US, just released some statistics last week. And they said, compared to all other cancers, so breast, colon, lung cancer, Compared to all of those, liver cancer is increasing faster, and deaths from liver cancer is also increasing, and many of these is related to infection with hepatitis B or hepatitis C. As I mentioned, cirrhosis means scarring, or severe scarring, end-stage liver disease. And if this happens, then you're at risk of liver failure and death without a liver transplant. In Alberta, up in Edmonton, we've done about 1,200 liver transplants since 1989, and 40% of those were related to viral hepatitis. So 40% of patients that had a liver transplant had either hepatitis B or hepatitis C. So this is not a rare disease in Canada. This is a serious disease, and it's important that we increase increase access to treatment and diagnosis for our patients. So the news is not all bad. This is a representative from the Canadian Liver Foundation, and you can go onto their website to hear her story. Her name is Sharon, and she contracted hepatitis C from contaminated blood in the 1970s. She was infected for over 30 years, and there were no effective treatments. In 2014, she got the new directly acting antiviral agents for hepatitis C and she's cured. And my patient said to me today, and I'm like not exaggerating, Dr. Coffin, it's like a miracle. And it is. I mean, 10 years ago, I don't feel I'm that old. When I started out in medicine, the, the treatments for hepatitis C, they were horrible. They were toxic. They had horrible side effects. They only worked in about 50% of people. And now we have these pills you take for a few weeks, 
and you're cured. So it's, it's pretty cool. So just to review a few things about hepatitis again. Hepatitis A, as I said, it's like you get food poisoning, uh, you get better. Um, there is a vaccine that can prevent infection. Hepatitis B, there's also a vaccine. And this vaccine has been around for 30 years, and it's made a huge impact on reducing the burden of disease. One of my students, she's a medical doctor from China, and she has seen you know, that there's been a tremendous decline in the incidence of new infections with hepatitis B just by introducing childhood vaccination or vaccinating infants. We also have good treatments for hepatitis B that can control the infection, so people do get better. But the problem is that the treatments don't cure. And if you already have 250 million people infected worldwide, we have to find a cure for this disease. As I mentioned, hepatitis C, we do have drugs. We have drugs that can cure, and it's a miracle. But these drugs are very expensive. They say that a course of therapy in the U.S. costs $100,000. So this was a huge impact at the W Health organization. If a rich country like Canada can't afford these drugs, how could a country like Egypt or Pakistan or India, which has a huge burden of hepatitis C, afford those drugs? So we did get them added to the essential medicines list, and that was because we wanted to have government, public health, um, interest groups, and pharmaceutical industries to work together to try and increase access to these therapies. So now I just want to switch gears a little bit and tell you about myself and how I started out and why I'm studying hepatitis virus. So I'm from Newfoundland. I'm from Fogo Island, Newfoundland. And if you don't know where that is, I'll show you on the map later. And I studied at Memorial University. And my research mentor then and now was Dr. Thomas Mikulak. And he is a well-known expert in viral hepatitis. And in Newfoundland, he had a woodchuck colony for studying hepatitis virus. And you're probably thinking, uh, woodchucks? Uh, I don't quite see the connection here. So let me explain, OK? So this is a, a map of the woodchuck hepatitis virus genome. So picture it as like the architectural plans of the virus, or the map of the virus. And if you compare that, to the hepatitis B virus genome, you can see that they look very similar. The structure, the organization, the size of the different gene products. And in fact, woodchucks infected with woodchuck hepatitis virus do get liver disease. They get cancer and they get hepatitis. So they're a very good model for studying hepatitis B. And in Dr. Michalak's lab, and this is a picture of the woodchucks, we studied the animals to see what would happen if you got infected with low doses of the virus. Is there a risk of developing hepatitis as well as developing cancer? And in my project, we studied animals that had been born to mothers following recovery from hepatitis, so infected with low doses of the virus. And we found something very interesting that had never been found before. I've been telling you all along, hepatitis attacks the liver. Well, in these animals, there was no virus found in the liver. So look on the left panel within that red box. You don't see any black marks, right? There's no hepatitis virus found in the liver. But all of the immune cells, or cells that, that uh, fight infection, the, um, the lymphoid cells, the spleen, the lymph node, the bone marrow, these, in these cells, using the very sensitive techniques that we had available at the time, we could find the hepatitis B virus. So this made us think that maybe hepatitis B infects the liver as well as the immune cells, and this is how it's able to persist in your body and not able to, and not able to clear it. So I'm a hepatologist, and I'm a clinician scientist, and so when I see my patients, I want to treat them, I want to make them feel better, but at the same time, when I'm looking at them, I'm wondering, is there a better way to treat you? Is there a better way of predicting your risk of developing liver disease or, or liver cancer? And can I do work in my lab or in the clinic to try and answer these questions? Some of the questions we had, which you're probably just after listening to Dr. Medin's presentation, is what happens if you have obesity and fatty liver disease? Fatty liver disease is also a, a major health problem here in Canada, and the Canadian Liver Foundation just released statistics that one in four people in Canada have fatty liver disease. What happens if you have HIV? HIV causes AIDS, also attacks your immune system. What if you have two viruses together, Hep B and HIV together? So in one of the studies, 
we looked at patients that had been put on antiviral therapy for hepatitis B. So they've been on treatment for many years, and we are wondering what happens in terms of their risk of developing liver cancer. And this graph shows on the upper line the predicted risk if they didn't get treatment, and the bottom line is the actual risk, the number of people that did get liver cancer. And you can see quite early on, the lines start to split, and that by four years, there was a significantly reduced cancer risk. So I guess we can sort of congratulate ourselves and say, yeah, you know, we're doing a good job, and our patients, we are reducing their risk of liver cancer. But then I'm wondering, when can we stop treatment? When is the virus completely gone in these individuals? And so we're doing some work in my lab, and we, we did some other, some other studies. One of the studies we did to answer that question is look at liver transplant patients. Now, normally we wouldn't stop treatment in patients that, had, that are undergoing liver transplant, but this was an opportunity at the time of their transplant to collect their blood, to collect their immune cells, and to collect their liver tissue from the old liver that's being replaced. And then these patients had been on treatment for a long time. I know that because it's important to suppress the virus before they go into transplant. And by regular clinical tests, we can't pick up the virus in their blood. Using our more sensitive tests in the lab, we can find the virus in all of the compartments, in the blood, in the liver, and in the immune cells, which is not traditionally thought to be a place where the virus would hang out. And then the second thing we found is that the virus CCC DNA is still there in the liver and in the immune cells. And I'm trying to, in trying to explain that, this concept to you, I would relate it to like the Trojan horse of hepatitis B. It's a very sinister part of the virus that sits within the nucleus of the cell. And if you don't kill the Trojan horse, you're not going to eradicate the infection. And so it's definitely, despite many years of potent treatment, the CCC DNA is still there. And so a lot of the new therapies that are coming through the pipeline for hepatitis B is trying to find ways to eradicate the virus and targeting this, this molecule. And I'd mentioned before that we we're also interested in looking at what ha happens if you have another virus that attacks your immune system. So now we have this new information that hepatitis B infects immune cells. We already know that HIV infects immune cells. We already know that's how you get AIDS or the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. What happens if you have the two of them together? So in my clinic, I was able to get blood samples from patients that had hepatitis B alone or hepatitis B and HIV together, take out their immune cells, and look within those different compartments what happens. And the interesting thing we found, it actually had never been published before, was that within T helper cells, or CD4 positive T cells, the cells that HIV targets and eradicates or, or, or uh, attacks, in those cells, if you have hepatitis B together, the hep B can't be detected. So it's like there's some sort of dynamic viral interaction, some sort of fight going on within the T helper cells. I, I can't explain it. It's something that I would like to explore further, but it was certainly a very interesting, interesting finding. And then the last thing I wanted to show you is some work that we've done looking at the hepatitis B virus genotype. And we'd already alluded to you know, the bacterial genome having multiple different varieties. Hepatitis B can also come in different varieties or types. And this can actually be related to your ethnic background and the country in which you first became infected with the virus. And the genotype can also impact your risk of developing liver disease, cirrhosis, cancer, and response to treatment. And for example, genotype A, um, if you have that genotype, you may be originally from Africa or certain parts of Europe, and you may respond better to interferon therapy. And in this study, we looked at multiple clinics across the country, major liver clinics that treat a lot of hepatitis B patients. And interestingly, we found that the different genotypes across the country were quite varied. For example, in Toronto, the major genotypes were B and C, and these patients were mainly of Chinese or Asian descent. In Edmonton and Calgary, we have what you call a more multicultural or multi-ethnic uh, background uh, of patients with hepatitis B, and this might impact you know, treatment decisions going forward for, pa for, for patients in our, in our clinic, especially with the new drugs that are, that are being uh, under development for hepatitis B. And I said I was going to show you where Fogo Island is on the map, and there it is on the northeast coast of Newfoundland. And this is a picture of Fogo Island. It does look like Greenland, but I didn't get cod liver oil growing up. <laughs> So last year, I formed the Canadian Hepatitis B Virus Network. And this is a network of clinicians, hepatologists, infectious disease specialists, and um, 
researchers across the country, and our goal is to try and increase awareness about hepatitis B, to collaborate on research, and hopefully, you know, contribute towards uh, finding a cure and increasing access to treatment for viral hepatitis. The WHO has a very ambitious strategy to eliminate viral hepatitis as a major public health threat by 2030. I've been invited back to the WHO. I'm going back there next year in Geneva to act again as the, um, on the Essential Medicines Committee. And I hope that the work I'm doing here in the Cummings School of Medicine in the Canadian Hepatitis B Network and the research will contribute in some, some small way to, the, to that goal. Thank you.